Throwback Thursday, and from the vault, an interview with the great journalist Barbara Emil. This is from the early 80s. She'd just written a book. I took it very seriously and listened to the exchange and how good she is on picking up my challenge about her, about her writing, and about an obscure court case called Defumus versus University of Washington. This is Barbara Emil. I've never really been more puzzled than I am today. There's a woman sitting across from me who wants my help. She wants me to help sell her books to you and sell herself to you as a media star and someone to listen to. But what puzzles me is that she may also be very sincerely wanting to help me get across a, a provocative and enlightened point of view. She's Barbara Emil, a writer and broadcaster who has a book out called Confessions. Barbara's experience seems to be this. She went in one end of the 60s when everybody's opinion mattered, no matter how stupid, and you could spend four years getting a degree just to learn from a sociologist that everything is relative. And she got pushed out the other end thinking that that period and what it stood for was nonsense. She believes there are differences in people of different ethnic and racial backgrounds and that all the civil rights laws can't change that and we should have the freedom to say someone is stupid without getting sued. She seems sick of bleeding heart liberals. Well, here's what she says. We all want clean air, as clean as possible, but not at the price of jobs and a decent way of life. We all want to preserve as much of nature as possible, but to prevent a power dam because of the darter fish unknown till the demolition crews came, to prevent or delay by a decade or so the construction of an oil pipeline because of the presumed habits of a few caribou herds or the total preservation of a Stone Age culture, are we to be held hostage in our land by a herd of animals or by 15,000 people who want, understandably, all that is in the shop windows of modern civilization and all the civil liberties they are entitled to, but without, at least according to their political leaders, allowing this civilization to go on creating what they wish to share? We all want the right to retain our roots, if this pleases us, but what is the enforced program of multiculturalism costing us? ethnic group against ethnic group, one country fragmented into a thousand consciousnesses. These are the words of Barbara Emil, author of Confessions. Good morning, Barbara. Good morning. That was a long introduction, but uh, you're kind of confusing, and it's a confusing book. I'm not sure whether you're a really good example of the excesses of the Austro-Hungarian Empire or one of the few real civil libertarians around. And you're confused, too, because you've been both. I'm not confused any longer, and I think I know what I, what I am and where I'm going. I suppose if I'm confused at all is simply the onslaught and the venom of some of the attacks that are now made on me. Uh, you see, it's a, it's a very, very simple thing. You said earlier in your introduction that I want you to sell me as a media star and a celebrity, among other things. And of course, in a, f in a curious way, it's true. Because if I want my message to be heard in this country, where in fact the left lip has virtually a stranglehold on the newspapers and on radio and television, then I have to make use of everything I've got, and that is to become a media celebrity so I can dance my little jig, sing my little song, and put my message across. You say that people should be able to say um, someone is a, a, a rotten uh, um, Lithuanian if they want to. But isn't the point in, in asking people not to do that so that young people or impressionable people or stupid people don't get the idea that Lithuanian is synonymous with stupid? Listen, I'll give you an example. My sister had a thing about war toys. She really didn't want her young child to see war toys till he was older because she loathes war, as we all do. And so her little boy never saw war toys. He never watched it on television. He didn't go to school. He just played in the streets. And one day he came over to where I was living in, in a room, and I had from the CBC a dummy gun that had been used in one of the TV series. And he picked it up, and he looked at me, and he went, bang, bang, you're dead. Hmm. All the sanitation in the world will not prevent kids from calling one another names. You can, you can go through textbooks, you can go through radio and television. Kids will always come up with name calling. My point is that the names that we all called one another in school, and I called people names, and I was called the little kike and the little heeb and the dirty Jew, and I called other people names. Those are not the things that turn people into vicious racists and vicious bigots. Those are the benign tumors of liberty. And I do think that passing legislation to prevent people calling other people names, while it may be admirable in its intent, 
Because I want to live in a society where people don't judge you on the color of your skin, where you were born, who your parents were, what your creed is. But to pass that legislation to cure the disease of name calling is a cure that is worse than the disease itself. It will not stop the real vicious side of racism. You say that a group such as the Ontario Human Rights Commission couldn't have stopped a Hitler or a Stalin. Do you, well, the, <laughs> do you really think that, that the, the public consciousness that is brought on by such groups really wouldn't have helped stop those two people? The Weimar Republic, out of which Hitler grew, was very big on human rights. They didn't have the name human rights, but they had all kinds of protection of civil liberties. A Stalin or a Hitler are those kinds of monsters, those aberrations of humanity that the best legislation in the world won't stop. You see, in order to be a society civilized enough to actually want to stop racism, to actually think of a human rights commission, you have to have reached a certain level of civilization to begin with. And if a Hitler or a Stalin comes along, then it is an absolute freak. It's a dreadful disease, and only guns and bayonets will stop that. Barbara, when your book is good, it's very good, and when it's bad, it's very bad. Give me an example. You almost seem to make the argument that um, the Medicare system that we have now is not necessarily all that great, merely because you had a good ex experience with a doctor before Medicare came in and a bad one with a doctor after Medicare came in. That's not exactly a great uh, scientific survey you've done. It is not a scientific survey at all, and it is not my business in this book to try and give solutions. What I'm asking is that people start looking at problems from a different perspective. All right, but your examples of... Um, the university professors who have been drummed out of town by the left libbers and your experience with the Human Rights Commission vis-a-vis -vis referring to Germans in the Second World War as Huns was a much more um, journalistically or academically pure discussion. The one about Medicare was whimsical. The one about Medicare was based on the philosophy that when something becomes free, and I use the word free in quotes because people think that it's free. When, it, when a service appears to become free, as medical health care appears to, then it becomes treated like air and water, and that is with a lot less concern. I was using this philosophically. People are now, to my mind, abusing Medicare because they think it's free. They go more often than they need to, and that forces the state into a position which it is now being forced into. Your medical services begin to go bankrupt, and in order to patch up the situation because you can't roll back Medicare because it's politically suicidal. You have to figure out how to save money and then you bring in the coercive society. You start preventing doctors from opting out. You start forcing people to do certain things in the name of medi preventative medicine which infringes on their rights to which I have to put on a seat belt now because if I get into an accident I'm going to cost OHIP money. The next step is that I'm going to have to wear a coat if the temperature drops below 32 because if I get pneumonia, I'll cost OHIP money. Or maybe I'll have to curtail my fatty intake. Or maybe I'll have to stop smoking by legislation. I was using the whole concept of free medical insurance as a philosophical concept that leads to a position of bankruptcy in the state because of the attitudes it brings on and then coercive legislation to patch things up. Now, for God's sake, don't misunderstand me. I want medical insurance there for the indigent. I want it there for those calamitous kinds of illness which any citizen would be bankrupt by if they had. What I am suggesting is that we look at possibly deterrent fees or we look at private medical schemes simply so that people understand that medical insurance and OHIP is not really free at all and we bring about a different attitude. All right, let me get on to another point. And I really want you to listen to this one. You criticize the media, and I want to criticize you as a media person for something, and maybe it won't mean anything now, but maybe you'll think about it in a year or so. I don't think you're as well known as you think you are. I haven't spent a lot of time in Toronto. I've been here a year. I've been out in the prairies. I've been in the Maritimes. I don't read you in Maclean's. Therefore, I don't know, I didn't know the history of who was attacking you and what you were defending yourself against. I don't know why you know Anne Margaret or Roger Smith or, or uh, Jane Fonda. It was, all, it was a lot of name dropping to me, which um, sounded uh, condescending to me, as if uh, I'm supposed to know that you hang around with the beautiful people. I didn't get the point of a lot of the name dropping. I'm surprised you, you call it name dropping. I 
try to, I, I've, it has never occurred to me that I am well known. Uh, in that book, I charted certain geographical travels, including trips to America with, as I put it, my boyfriend who happened to be a film director by the name of George Bloomfield. And I explained how I turned up in Los Angeles and how I arrived at certain impressions of the American way of life. And those vignettes of Anne Margaret, who I admired enormously, of Marlo Thomas, uh, of the Lady Bullfighter were vignettes of American life set in the context of my travels with a film director and the undoing of certain preconceptions that I had about American way of life. Was it a revelation to you that Jane Fonda latched on to causes for publicity and for her own gain? I think what was a revelation was that as a feminist myself, I never understood how anti-feminine the women's movement was and how many people like Jane Fonda, who at the time were talking very much about women's rights and a whole other pile of issues, were not in fact the allies but were the enemy. That was a revelation. Now, I, I, I plead stupidity. Possibly you would yeah, be you're brighter good at that. and you would know ahead of time. No, I appreciate that in the book that you say, look, uh, I thought this way at one time and I was gullible or something. I appreciate that. Let's talk a touch about uh, more weighty things, such as your interpretation of the liberal philosophers Locke, Rousseau, Burke, Hobbes, and all these people. Um, you may take them slightly too seriously. I mean, Locke was an apologist, and a lot of these people were r writing propaganda for the existing uh, monarchies or whoever was in power at the time. I mean, do you take them all that seriously? I think one takes an amalgam of the best thought and asks, what, what are the alternatives to it today? If you ask me, do I want to go back to a kind of totally laissez-faire 19th century liberalism in which big business was totally unbridled and it was dog-eat-dog, -dog, I'd say, Christ, no. Given that situation, I'd prefer social democracy. What I want are the best values of that time. And I think the best values of that time were recognition of individual liberty and that very special thing, equality before law, and I keep screaming about it, but equality before law before all, for all citizens is the keynote of a liberal democracy. And what we are moving towards are all kinds of extra procedures that circumvent the law. Little regulatory agencies that you can't appeal in the courts. Little rules and regulations that aren't made by parliament or aren't made to go through due process of law. they made by faceless bureaucrats to whom you're unaccountable. An example which I think is not in the book is in fact something like prisoners' rights in this country. One of, my, one of the areas I loathe the most is our parole system. Uh, prisoners in our prisons who wish to get parole cannot do it in an open court where lawyers can represent their point of view and where they can hear why they're denied parole. It's done in a room to which they have virtually no access with no one to represent them, and they have no recourse to find out why parole is denied to them. That's the kind of system I loathe. It's unfair to prisoners in our jails, and by God, it's happening to people outside the jails as well. We are being ruled by people who are not accountable to the ballot box and not accountable to the rule of law. I've posed the following question to the French in Penetanguishene fighting for their own school, to members of the um, Council on the Status of Women, and to editors of feminist magazines. I'll pose it to you. The Supreme Court in the United States ruled with the black racial problems that separate is not equal. Uh, that was the, the, the Jim Crow laws in the U.S. to keep the blacks out of the process. I pose it to women, I pose it to the French. Do you want separate and do you consider that equal? Most say yes. What do you say? It's a model of, of philosophy and pragmatism and I'd have to take each example. Um, I loathe the Jim Crow laws and in that separate is not equal. I went along with that particular decision. If you ask me about the Backey case, the Weber case, the affirmative action cases in the United States since then, I think they're dreadful and I think they're a violation of civil liberties. Defumus versus University of Washington, a fellow because he's Puerto Rican or something gets into the university because they need X number of Puerto Ricans upheld by the Supreme Court. I think it's unfair. You see, it is perfectly true that the history of slavery was a dreadful thing. The blacks were treated badly in the United States. But if you want to <coughs> replace one lot of injustice, and that was the injustice to the blacks, you can't replace it with a new injustice, and that is injustice to whites or injustice to Puerto Ricans or injustices to blondes. All you can do is say that from this point on, 
we were wrong. We treated our blacks badly. We treated our Indians badly. We treated our Eskimos badly. We kept them out of schools. We had quotas against them. We made them second-class citizens. But from this day on, we are going to have a condition of equality. Now, that takes time, I know, and you may be able, for example, in the condition of deprived people, create special schools outside the regular system for them. But to start a new quota system, to start new quotas for Indians, to start new quotas for blacks in schools so that whites are left out and you've created a whole new class of discriminated citizens is to replace one injustice with another injustice. Thank you, Barbara. Barbara Amiel is the author of Confessions. It was going to be entitled Fascist Bitch because that's what she's called a lot of the time, but that's too easy a dismissal of a valuable divergent opinion. Any views expressed here are not necessarily those of the McKenzie Institute, its speakers, sponsors, or supporters. But the Institute is dedicated to fostering public discussion, debate, and education about security matters. Google the McKenzie Institute to join the discussion. The McKenzie Institute is grateful to its sponsors and supporters. Some of our short pods and long talks are a result of the support of Heathbridge Capital Management Limited the National Post, and Dundurn Publishing.